Thank you, Akshay, uh, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I think, uh, first of all, let me start by congratulating Ravi, uh, is it? Ravi Prindha and, of course, the Yudhya Roga team for an incredible year. I think what we've seen over the last 45 minutes it is clearly something that it is not just heartwarming, it is just, it's true impact for changing millions of lives and true contribution to nation building. Thank you for doing what you do and thank you for the partnership uh, which we are incredibly proud of because it's in some way a small contribution to the big work that you're doing uh, towards the larger cause of building the country. Now, I've been truly privileged to be here, and I don't see it say that lightly. In fact, all of us in this room are potentially uniquely privileged because we were blessed with a superpower. The superpower has helped us intellectually debate issues, contextualize, analyze, make a change in our lives, the lives of our loved ones, but beyond that, it enables us to make the change in the lives of so many beyond our immediate uh, family and friends. What is that superpower? That is the superpower of education. Because that's something we were blessed with. That is something that enabled us to come and make a massive difference. But the fact remains that, as they say, 21st century India is like a Dickens skin tale of two cities. Uh, yes, it's definitely a best of times for some of us who have actually seen the benefits of education translate into great lives, great careers. And yet, there are millions out there, some of those millions we saw in the few films that were played over the last 45 minutes, who are possibly not so privileged, who have dreams, but those dreams are not yet realized because the challenges that come in the way. As a country, we have made progress. I mean, we, we see the power of tech and how it's potentially enabling your thousands of volunteers, changing hundreds and thousands of lives, to lakh if I remember right, last year alone. But the fact is, there are structural changes that are very much still there. There are infrastructure changes that are very much, challenges that are very much there. There are issues of capacities, there are issues of supply, there are issues of resources. And those, aren't going away anytime soon. And yet, there are these millions of people who somehow find a way of hurdling these challenges, navigating the, the bumps along the way, whether it's the resource bump or the infrastructure bump or the accessibility bump, and come to the other side armed with degrees and qualifications. And yet, those degrees and qualifications don't necessarily are a ticket to a better life. Why is that? Why is it that 50% of our young graduates do not have skills that make them employable to what the industry needs? In fact, the conversation I want to have with you today over the next 10 minutes or so is actually the conversation around enabling the education to employability pathways. Because what's good education if it doesn't necessarily translate into better life, the life that all of us actually enjoy? The damage as a result of this lack of what I call the broken ladder is the fact that it not only impacts individuals who have gone through the hurdles and got the degrees and impact their life and lives of their loved ones, it also has a cascading and cumulative effect on the society at large. Because we always have been coming up with the belief that education is a ticket to a better life. And if that foundational belief itself is shaken, what happens? It actually makes people rethink it actually has the potential to set it aside. So how do we collectively, as this group of individuals, this group of change makers who committed their lives to the cause of education, how can we collectively solve this problem? I want to talk about 
three ideas that I believe are at the root cause of what's causing this wide chasm. The gap in aspirations, the gap in skills, and the gap in resources. Let's talk a little more about that, each one of these, these points. Aspirations gap. While all of us were studying, and I'm sure you remember during your school years, early college years, there was this conversation at home about what career path you want to choose. And more often than not, most of us were possibly presented with two choices. Medicine, engineering. Right? Anyone? All of you can relate to that? Okay. For all the smart ones in the room who possibly had the aptitude uh, and the desire to really pursue that career path, went on to be a fantastic career. For some of the others like me, you were not so lucky. You didn't really come with uh, a born interest in, in, the, in sciences. But then, we chose a different path, of course, uh, with the right guidance and the right support system, again found a meaningful way to a career path. The reason I'm talking to you about this is because as our country has progressed, as the world has progressed, career choices have become exemplary. You can choose, you can have your passion translated into the right career choice and you can make a success out of it. But how does one know, how do these kids in the remotest rural districts know that these career paths are we do? If you look at the data alone in India, for every 3,000 students, there is one career counselor. And we can compare that with any part of the world and we actually fall short. Now how would that one career counselor actually provide a pathway to the right choice for these 3,000 students? Something for us to reflect on and something for us to think about as we actually made the education to employability journey a reality. Let's talk about the skills gap. Now, I gave you one data point about mismatch in industry skills that you buy. Well, let me give you another one. 42% of our youth under the age of 25 struggle to find a job. Armed with all the degrees and careers that we collectively name. We work in the STEM domain, we are a tech company, and we know that with all the advancements, all the innovations happening in the space, and every research pointing to the fact that 80% of the jobs of the future would demand STEM skills. How does it contrast with the reality of our own country? Well, if you look at our grade 1 to 8, where we spend most of our time on, for every 100 students who actually go through this education journey and at the other end come out with degrees and qualifications, three of them actually have a career in STEM. In India, we create 12 to 14 million jobs every year, and yet STEM skills continue to be in incredible shortage. So clearly, as a system, as we think of educating, we need to think of educating with skills that matter. Let's go to the third aspect that I talked about, the resource gap, and I'm sure in this room everyone can possibly relate to that possibly very, very closely. Indeed, intent might be there, but there are not enough resources to translate that intent into action. Whether it's schools or colleges, one fifth of kids actually drop out as a, because of lack of financial resources. So clearly, we have an issue of addressing aspirations, we have an issue of addressing skills, and we have an issue of plugging resource gaps. How do we do that? Well, first of all, we need to think about whether they are discrete individual problems or they are actually connected problems. I'd like to challenge you to think as these to be absolutely connected ecosystems. If we have to think about solving it, we have to think about solving it as a stack and not solving it in isolation, or at least feeding from one stack to the other, depending on which stack we are choosing to play in. What I'll do is I'll actually give you an example of some of the work that we do at the Infosys Foundation which is aiming to address this very problem statement. And I'll take three examples. Let me start with the one with what we do with the TV there by itself. I mean, you heard about the 100 uh, schools with, with STEM curriculum that have been set up in the aspirational districts. So 
what you did not hear is how it is translated into impact. It is built up telling me little while earlier we reached 20,000 students. We've done 10,000 sessions. All that is great, but has it translated into people sticking in the classrooms? The answer is yes. I'm told 75% of the kids continue to come over and over again to attend these sessions because they seek value in the kind of content that your volunteers are providing, which was never accessible to them before. So clearly, something that's preparing them right at the foundational level for the skills that are there in the future. Let me give you another example. This time I want to touch upon what we do on the, on the resource platform. Now we all know that when it comes to higher education, especially undergrad courses, uh, women or girls are at a disadvantage over boys because the way our society is structured, if choices have to be made, normally higher education choices aren't really supported as well for girls as for boys and, and, and they adequately to support that. So what we did is we actually launched what we call the Infosys Foundation STEM Stars program. What it does, it's a 100 floor outlay that we've, that we've uh, decided in phase one which actually provides it, uh, support to 2,000 girls for medicinal and engineering colleges and other STEM related subjects. The idea is very simple. Uh, as long as the resource can be eliminated, can we accelerate the pathways to success? And this is just a few months old, but from what our team tells us, the application ecosystem is already flooded. You can clearly see the gaps and the opportunity that exists despite multiple scholarships by government and private institutions. The gap between what's available, what's accessible, is still very, very high. We need to do a lot more. The last one that I want to touch upon is a platform driven approach. When we talk about the potential of platforms and how it's actually creating impact at scale, not just in the country but the world over. We've also been privileged to actually build one such platform over the last few years. This was a part of our uh, ESG aspiration that we outlined. We back in 2020, we said, okay, we want to actually reskill 10 million kids globally on the skills of the future, the digital skills. So we decided to actually launch this platform called Infosys uh, It's got 20,000 courses from Infosys, <coughs> from Harvard Business Publishing from Coursera, but we for many of our partners, the idea is simple. As long as you're in school, you're in college, or you are always on the learner. As long as you have the desire to learn new age tech, new age disruptions, accessibility should be free of cost for the very best content in the world. Millions, millions of hours of learning is happening day in and day out. We even have certifications that actually give you a ticket to potential employment based on industry needs. So the idea is we have to think about this problem with this thing. We collectively have to think about this as an opportunity where we are contributing not just to an end goal of education and degrees, but contributing to an end goal of a better I'm going to close this, this uh, address with a little story for you. And after all, we've been listening to stories all day long, so let me, let me share one more. Now, this is a story of uh, an eighth grader uh, from uh, Tanjur and Tamil. Uh, as you know, it's a small town. Uh, the, the protagonist here, his name is Beba. Uh, he studied in Kirti Vidyalaya. Family comes from modest means. Uh, and he has this rather unique aspiration, if I may say. He wants to make a career in medical robotics. As specific as it can for the eighth grader, I'm surprised myself, but it's, it's a true story. And uh, however, keeping in mind the little town that he lives in, the limited role models, limited pathways to what do I need to do to really build my digital skills? What do I need to do to actually Realized my dream with very few options left, he actually turned to Infosys Pinball. He actually went on, did foundational courses, and recently his mother told us that he actually uh, participated in a competition organized by NASA 
where he managed to not just discover an asteroid, but even name it. Clearly advancing his aspirations from a mere dream to a reality. <laughs> That's all I have for you all today. Thank you so much for listening to me. And as I walk uh, off the stage, I'm going to leave you with the memory of a protagonist. The visual memory of what happens when dreams are getting based to fly. Thank you so much.